Good morning and welcome to Face the Nation. We've got a lot to get to today, but we want to begin with our White House team. Chief White House Correspondent Major Garrett and White House and Senior Foreign Affairs Correspondent Margaret Brennan. Margaret, I want to start with you. North Korea, this news of an ICBM test. What's the U.S. response so far? Well, we've seen a show of force from the United States, some saber-rattling indirect response to North Korea. You have a flyover. You've had a missile test immediately after uh, the North Korean test um, jointly with South Korean forces. All of this is meant to dissuade further tests. But look, this is the second intercontinental ballistic missile test in a month. And it, this one flew longer and for farther uh, distance than the previous one on July 4th. And this seems to be, according to outside experts, uh, demonstrating that this missile, because it went 3,700 kilometers into space, mm -hmm. that kind of energy shows it could hit uh, the continental United States. The Pentagon won't confirm this at this point. The Pentagon also won't confirm or comment on the fact, uh, on the status of whether they've been able to miniaturize a nuclear tip to put on that missile. But these numbers, this analysis is really causing some deep concern that North Korea is progressing faster uh, and much more rapidly towards the ability uh, to actually arm a nuclear missile. So, Major, the president's response, uh, he has been working on getting the Chinese to put pressure on the North Koreans, but he has tweeted recently, we will no longer allow this to continue. China could easily, so could easily solve this problem. Before, he had said, well, he understood that it wasn't so easy. What's the president? Well, look, if there's a culture or a bureaucracy more immune from the improvisational and impetuous nature of Twitter than China, I don't know what it is. <laughs> China does not think of this term, these difficulties, in terms of presidential tweets or momentary thoughts from the president of the United States. It has, as the president has conceded, occasionally, lots of diverse interests involved here. And it is trying to apply as much pressure as it can against North Korea. But it is clear, as Margaret indicated, that North Korea is not only moving faster, but more aggressively than it ever has under any other previous administration. And that makes this, within the councils of the White House and the Pentagon, the number one strategic challenge for this president at a time when what the White House is radiating, not just to our country, but to the world, an atmosphere of instability at minimum, chaos at maximum, these things are colliding at just about the worst time. Let me ask you, Major, about Reince Priebus, the chief of staff. He is gone. Was he ever given a chance to do his job? Initially, yes. Um, but one of the problems for this White House is the president himself in the sense that he does not adhere to any traditional or even historically rational organizational system for his own White House. He likes the idea that five or six different people walk into the West Wing every day believing they are, for a moment, the effective chief of staff. He likes that rivalry, that embedded, intense competition, but what it does is it prevents any sort of flow of ideas, policies, debate, and projection out to the rest of the administration what the White House intends to do and how it wants it to be explained to the country. So, Margaret, Secretary Kelly is now uh, first among equals. What's his role? What's he going to do? What does he have to do? Well, look, if, if you're betting that a general is going to clean this up and institute a chain of command, much as he would like to, it's going to require a culture shift from what Major just described. And it's not clear that the president is going to do that. Does Anthony Scaramucci, does Kellyanne Conway all of a sudden no longer have the right to walk into the Oval but first check in with the chief of staff? I don't know that that's actually going to change. Uh, but for General Kelly, it's going to be really interesting to watch him. How does his insertion there uh, change the ability uh, to interact with Capitol Hill. He doesn't have political experience. He's talked in ways that say he doesn't really have a lot of, you know, uh, favor or like dealing either with the press or with politicians. He likes policy and getting things done. How do you match that with the job requirements mm -hmm. there? And how is he going to interact with, say, National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster, uh, who is a three star to his four? <laughs> um, how does that how does that interact? How does that institute and, and affect some of the uh, foreign policy challenges that are very, very real? And a final question to you, Major. One of the jobs of a chief of staff is to tell the president no. Mm -hmm. but Anthony Scaramucci has said, no, we need this president to be more like President Trump. He told yes all the time, and yes in big, bold letters, as if there is any lack of big, bold letters in the White House saying yes to the president. The other issue for General Kelly will be the assumption going in, you begin to see this in some of the commentary, well, the president loves generals, he respects them, and he deals with them. Well, look at the most recent evidence. His general, who's the defense secretary, completely taken by surprise by this transgender announcement, a show of 
at minimum, disrespect and disorganization. H.R. McMaster keeps coming in and out of the president's favor as national security advisor, a former general who can never really know what his actual status with the president is. So you can assume that there's this deference and respect to generals, but it hasn't played out. Mm -hmm. And as Margaret said, this is about the culture of the president and how he treats his job and those around him. And if that doesn't change, more of the same. All right, Major Margaret, thanks so much.